Thank you so much, everyone. Good morning, UKIP. <laughs> it's lovely to see so many of you here bright and early this morning. Um, I'm a chemistry teacher, and I first moved to London in 2001 uh, to teach chemistry there. And um, even though I teach chemistry, I've had a keen interest in politics for most of my life. But sometimes when I hear the politicians of the established party speak, I wonder if they have any idea what life is like for the ordinary people of this country. Don't you think that as well? <laughs> I wonder if they know what it's like to be a teacher or a nurse or a taxi driver or a small businessman earning a salary of 20,000 or 18,000 or 25,000 pounds a year stuck in their ivory tower in Westminster. And one of the things that we hear a lot about in the London campaign is housing. That's undoubtedly one of the biggest issues. And every mayoral hustings there is, and in the press every evening in London, you hear about the housing crisis all the time. And Peter has spoken a lot about that already. Um, but it's so bad, just to give you an idea of what it is actually like, if you want to buy a house, um, it's almost impossible now. I mean, this is the dream that people have in this country to be homeowners. And in London, you need a salary of about £60,000 just to get yourself a studio flat in Zone 6. And if you know London, you know Zone 6 is the edge of London on the very, very outskirts. And if you want to buy something in the centre of London, it's well nigh impossible unless you're a multimillionaire. And I feel very, very sorry for young people, even British young people coming out of university today, who are graduates, who come to get their first job in London, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and they find that they can't even today get themselves a room in a flat share if you're on an average salary, which is what I could do in 2001 as a teacher. But many, many young people, British graduates with a degree, can only get themselves on their salary a room, uh, sorry, a bed in a room share, not even a room in a flat share. Um, that's how bad the housing crisis is. It's dreadful. Um, not just housing is an issue, but as Peter mentioned earlier as well, many of our public services are overcrowded to the point of being bursting at the seams. And that's true of roads, trains, buses, tubes, primary schools, GP surgeries, and hospitals, all bursting at the seams in London. And the reason is so, so simple. But the other parties, the political parties, don't even seem to be able to mention it, let alone talk about it. And that is simply the massive, massive increase in the population. And most of that is due to rapid mass immigration. No. <laughs> And there is no shame in saying it because it's just common sense. And I'm glad to be in a party with a leader as great as we have in Nigel Farage, who has stood up over 20 years with courage and integrity to speak the common sense that this country needs to know and needs to hear, and the ordinary people of this country know in their everyday lives. Oh. <laughs> And in London, when I moved there in 2001, the population was 7.3 million. Today, it's 8.7 million. And most of the other political parties just have a blind acceptance that the population is going to keep on increasing by 100,000 uh, people a year or more. So we're told that in 2020, there'll be 9 million people. There may already be 9 million people because 8.7 million is just uh, the figure of the people we know about. It doesn't include uh, people who may be uh, in the city illegally. Um, by 2030, we're told we're going to have 10 million people. But where does it end? Are we going to have 12 million people in 2050 and 18 million people in 2100? Is London going to turn into Tokyo on Thames? <laughs> or are we going to uh, brick in and concrete over the green belt from Crawley up to Cambridge and turn it into a megalopolis of the, the kind you might see uh, in Mexico City, for example? I don't want that, and I don't think the people of London want that. I don't think the people of this country want that because, uh, as Peter said, there's something may be more important in the economy, and we have to look after our country, our countryside, and our city, our heritage, and our culture. <laughs> now, when we 
we talk about the mayor and we talk about the, the Greater London Authority and the London Assembly, there are three things that they're responsible for. Uh, the first is police and crime, uh, then transport and fire and emergency services. We talk about many other things, but those are the three main things that the mayor and the assembly have control over. Uh, and if I were a teacher giving the uh, mayors and assemblies of the past 16 years uh, a mark, I probably wouldn't give them an A. Uh, I might give them a C or a D for <laughs> their attainment uh, and effort. Let's think about the police, for example. Um, the plan for policing, I think, is, is so bad, maybe uh, one of my students could do better in making up a plan for police and crime in London. Um, the plan is to cut crime by 20%. By 2020. Okay, that's great. Good. We want to cut crime. Uh, but the uh, mechanism to get there is to cut funding to the police by 20% as well, <laughs> while the population is increasing by 100,000 a year. So there'll be another 500,000 people in the city by 2020. It just doesn't add up. It's ridiculous. And the only way the Metropolitan Police has kept going is because they've had to sell off half of their police stations. So as well as trying to cut crime, uh, we don't have as many police stations as we had. And some of them that have been sold off have been the oldest historical police stations, which do have a place in our heritage. And I think it's a tragedy that that has happened. And uh, has it worked? No. <laughs> it's not, of course, it hasn't worked. Uh, even looking at the Metropolitan Police's own figures, uh, crime statistics in London have gone up by 4% over the last 12 months. Dreadful. In terms of transport as well, I don't give the Mayor and Assembly of the past full marks. What no one talks about is that um, the funding for London Transport, a lot of it comes from the central government, from the Department of Transport, and the grant given to Transport for London is being cut in its entirety over the next three years. £650 million, which we have this year, to put into subsidising the, the tube network and the buses, and they need doing that, is going. And the other parties talk about how they're going to cut fares and do all these nice things, but no one mentions that the budget is being cut. And you cannot look at these things in isolation. You have to look at the budget for our public services in relation to what goes on in the country as a whole. And I think people in London, as well as in the wider country, are fed up of seeing our public services, our essential public services, cut while we give £55 million every single day to the European Union. Thank you, thank you. And as well as that, we're going to spend £50 billion over the next 10 or 50 years on HS2. What a waste of money that is <laughs> as well. And the overseas development budget is ballooning out of control. I mean, four billion of that is well spent giving money to em the disaster emergency relief and paying for medical care and paying for water wells to really help the poorest of poor people in countries around the world. And I don't think any of us would begrudge that and would want that to be cut. But when we're spending seven or eight billion pounds in excess of that, and large amounts of that goes into the pockets of a new class of billionaire wind barons and development consultants with large plush offices in Mayfair and third world dictators who stick the money in their pockets, don't help the people that it's supposed to go to, and it ends up in Swiss bank accounts rather than British taxpayers' money being spent in Britain. Isn't it dreadful? And in saying all this, I might sound a little bit gloomy uh, and a little bit hopeless, but there is always hope, of course. And um, in the last election, uh, I stood in a seat in central London, in south central London, called Camberwell and Peckham. And the incumbent in that seat is a, is a lady, I think, um, known as Harriet Harmon. <laughs> And uh, unfortunately, I didn't uh, unseat her uh, in that election. But coming from a standing start, because we didn't have a candidate there in 2010, 
uh, in 2015 in the election, in the reddest of red seats, UKIP got nearly 5% of the vote, even against Harriet Harman in one of the safest Labour seats in the country. And in the areas where UKIP is strongest, Dagenham, Bexley, Bromley, etc., we're routinely now scoring over 20% and sometimes over 30% of the vote, even in London, and that is a fantastic thing. <laughs> so, when it comes to the London Assembly elections, if any of you know anything about um, the London Assembly, there are 25 seats. And 14 of those seats are what we call super constituencies, and they're fought on a first-past-the-post basis. Uh, and then there are 11 seats, which are London-wide seats, and they're fought on a proportional basis. And that means that with those top-up seats, the percentage of votes that a party gets in London, providing they get over 5%, uh, will be proportional to the number of seats a party gets. And as Peter said, we are now polling in London 9 or 10%. So it will be almost inconceivable if the polls continue as they are that we don't have any representation on the London Assembly. And I want to see the beginning of UKIP having a permanent voice in the London, London Assembly to stand up for the ordinary people of London who are proud of their city and are tired of seeing their communities destroyed and dissolved and who don't want London to become just another irrelevant and demoralised provincial province in somewhere called the United States of Europe, but London to always be the capital city of Her Majesty's United Kingdom. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, UKIP.